and we give those data off on the cattle. Students, former students, and I think in one case. Thank you. Uh, so this talk is about something that once you understand it is blindingly obvious. So I'll apologize ahead of time. Uh, this mic seems really loud to me. Uh, you, is it okay at the back? Okay, good. Uh, and I got help from lots of students or former students or perhaps future students in some cases. So uh, if you don't understand this slide, you're in the wrong room. Uh, monads are what we use as a mechanism for expressing computation. So this is uh, the background to what we're going on. If you don't understand monads, you won't understand the remote monads. So I'm mentioning this. Uh, we have the IO monad. We have the maybe monad. Uh, we have, critically, we have bind and return. Bind is the way we take two monadic actions and can join them together to get things done, to build a bigger action that combines the two. And then uh, down here, read and write file, you're building up computations that are doing something. So background. Let's take an example of something we want to do. Let's try and control a canvas, or more specifically a remote canvas, because if we're inside a Haskell box, inside the, uh, the runtime system, the screen is a remote thing. That's the way we consider it. We could do this. We could have IO functions like line width and stroke style. The problem there is that when they're IO, we can only have one single canvas, or have different versions of, of, of line width. Uh, the ability to control Canvas, anyone can now write it, provided you can get to this function, you can start writing it. There's no enforced uh, behaviors. Uh, you have to remember to initialize them, and the API doesn't reflect the fact this is remote. So this is what we've done for most of our I.O. universe. And what we're proposing is there's another way of doing things that people have done for years, it just hasn't been given a name and what uh, we call it the uh, remote monad, and we call it a design pattern. Design patterns are sort of wavy way of saying there isn't a hackage package for this. It's something, there's dozens of hackage packages that use this particular design. So here's what we are proposing, is rather than build something out of the IO monad, you build it out of another monad that's specifically for that remote service, and then use a send command and what that send command does, which is like a run uh, command, takes that remote monad and runs the remote monad remotely so that you can get an answer locally. So in this case, if we wanted to send to a device the line width, we could say send to the device this line width. If we wanted to change the line color, we could send to the device the, uh, uh, the stroke style to red, and that would change the, the color of what goes on. Make sense? So that's the key idea, right? Here's the problem. If you want to change the line width and change the color, well, what happens here? You can, using the monadic constructs we have, you can bundle them together. You can try to do both things at the same time. Uh, what we want to have happen, what we want to explore is the ability to take monadic computations, jam them together into bundles and send these bundles together so we amortize the cost of talking to some sort of remote device or some sort of remote location. So can we bundle them together? There is an issue though. Monads or monadic computations return values. So even though it looks like we can just bundle everything together, no, it's not, it's not quite that straightforward. If we add an extra primitive, the primitive of is point and path, what we can see is a couple of examples here. If we send something to a device, we can ask, is this point inside the current path inside a particular state? And then we use the Boolean result immediately. So how can we take that piece of computation and ship it away? Because there's a local Boolean value being used. Or we can even extract the remote value out of a computation by uh, having a send, having a monadic function that returns a Boolean, and then returning the result directly inside the do notation. So the monadic commands inside send are executed in a lo remote location, but the results of these executions are made available to us locally. Does everyone see the issue there? We could have put everything together, but the great thing about monads is we can get intermediate, we can get results. The problem with these results is they're now local, and we want them to be remote. So let's think about some laws that we might be able to have 
when we're using uh, remote monads? Well, let's just pick up the laws that we know. Let's pick up the uh, monad transformer laws from the monad transformer paper from uh, 95, also known as the homomorphism laws. We have a send, which is a natural transformation, which takes a remote monad, some arbitrary remote monad, and then runs it locally, as in the remote runs on the remote location and you get the result locally. There's a local effect, which is your result, and there's a remote execution, which is your remote monad doing something remotely. And there's a couple of obvious rules, uh, which is if you return a value, and that's all you do, that's the same as returning the value. And if you do two actions, you can always divide them up into separate transactions. So there's no transactional behavior that we're trying to capture here. It's just the idea and the laws apply both ways. If you have two computations, you can, by the laws, join them together and get a single, co a single computation, a single bundle sent across. Okay? So, uh, let's power a toaster or make a to toaster do interesting things. If any of you know the answer to why we should do this, then uh, you should start a business because the Internet of Things isn't clear to a lot of people. Uh, including myself, but apparently programming toasters is the way to go. Uh, the, uh, the UK has been programming toasters for 15 years. Uh, some of you from the UK will get this uh, particular reference to this particular toaster that was a, a predecessor to the Internet of Things. So let's give it three things it can do. It can say something. So we say, we ask it to say hello and the toaster will say hello. Again, why? I don't know. We can ask what the temperature is. Now, is that the temperature inside the toaster or outside the toaster? Why does the toaster need to know what the temperature is? Again, I don't know, but we're going to make it remotely tell us what the temperature is. And finally, and most usefully, we can ask it to toast. So we can say, please toast some bread uh, for 120 seconds. Go ahead, toast, and then when you're finished, uh, I want you to return. So say is something I'm, I'm telling it to do. Temperature is something I'm telling it to do remotely and give me an answer back. And toast is something I'm doing, but I'm expecting it to wait till it's toasted before it will come back, before it will return. So the value coming back has a temporal aspect to it as well. And then we have a send function where we can send to a specific device, the toaster, the remote command. Okay? So let's build this up in Haskell. There's, there's quite a bit of Haskell code coming up. Let's build this up. It should... It should uh, it should be straightforward as we build it. Let's build the ability to do a say. So how will we do this? Well, we have a data structure, which has a, con a constructor say in a string. We have a, this is a model, so we've got a fake device here. That fake device has an asynchronous ability to send a string across to some remote location. And then our send is simply uh, asynchronously, please send to my remote toaster the show string of the say command. Make sense? So we're sending stuff across. We want to send to the toaster, do you want some toast? Uh, this could get annoying really quickly. <laughs> right, so what happens? Well, this is a, this is a, a sequence diagram. I've uh, um, taken some liberties in what, what I've done, but it's, uh, the, the concepts are, are completely standard. Uh, GCI, you're typing in send, send then creates a say constructor. Well, that's actually, a, a, that's actually an embedding rather than calling say itself. But what it does is the command sends across remotely to the toaster, do you want some toast? And then what comes back is that you, you immediately get a result because it's asynchronous and the toaster starts speaking. The, uh, the command design pattern is an established pattern. It's in the Gang of Four book. It's, uh, it's uh, completely standard. What about procedures? Procedures are more interesting because you have to send something across and get something back. We use a JDT here. So, that, so it's a, a deep embedding of, of the procedure. Uh, temperature uh, is a constructor that gives back a result. It's got the, uh, the argument that's got an int. And toast takes the int and, and goes across. And I haven't actually used the constructors for, to save space. I could, it, lowercase temperature equals uppercase temperature, etc. It's uh, all quite standard. So what about sending? To send, we're going to send synchronously. We're going to show the temperature or toast. 
We're going to send it across the remote locations and I'm going to decode it, decide what to do, and decide whether to send back a number, which is a temperature or a unit, which is a, 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 when it's actually finished toasting, at which point we do a GDT pattern matching. So this read here, I'll pull a corner here, this read here and this read here are different reads. They're at different types fundamentally. That's why we can't just do a, a straightforward pattern match for what goes on. So toasting is slightly more involved. You've got some JDTs to help make sure the types go in the right place at the, uh, at the right time. But if we want to send to the toaster the question to do temperature, here's what the diagram looks like here. We're sending temperature. Across goes the string temperature by itself. Back comes the temperature 56. Uh, I'm hoping that's Fahrenheit. And uh, then comes back. Uh, it gets decoded into a regular value and then returned as a result of the send. So we've got these two capabilities. Can we put them together to get a monad? And that's the key thing, uh, the key idea in the paper, the key thing that happens. A weak remote monad, so there's two types of remote monads. This is a simple one, and there's a more powerful one. They're both remote monads. A weak remote monad is a trivial implementation. A, re a weak remote monad sends each of its remote calls or primitives individually across. So every time you ask it to do anything, it's going to ferry across whatever networking connection you have, ask it the question and come back. And I've highlighted in red the key points here, uh, which is if you try to say something, then you're going to call send command, which is going to asynchronously, and uh, there's a um, one transformer here to make it uh, slightly cleaner, but uh, it's going to asynchronously send this, this, uh, the show immediately. When you do a procedure, likewise, it will asynchronously send the command over, wait for the answer, and the answer will come back. So the primitives are pausing uh, for the procedure until that action is done and come back. Don't procedures have functions inside them? How can you show them? Oh, no, there's, no fun there's nothing. I'll go back a slide if I can. No, they're just data structures. You can do deriving show. You can't do deriving read, which we've carefully sidestepped. And we sidestepped it because of Oleg, because he described parsing GDTs as addictive. So uh, we, don't want, we want to avoid that uh, particular uh, uh, issue. It's, it's actually orthogonal to what's going on here. So you're showing it, but you're losing the type information as you show and you send across. But that's OK. That's the toaster's problem to figure out what's going on there. So, uh, if we're toasting with this weak remote monad, what's happening? Well, we want to say to the toaster, do you want some toast? Ask the temperature, say, and ask it to say what the temperature is, and uh, then return so you can use it in a future inquiry. So what's happening here is that uh, you can see the say, the temperature, and the say, and for each of them, you're sending across a separate network packet. So you've got four primitives and four network packets going across. However, the structure by itself of writing stuff in monadic form as a submonad actually works really well and it's quite neat. So this by itself is a good use of the design pattern. But we can do better. We do better by using something called the strong remote monad. Here's the key idea here is rather than send everything individually, we try and bundle stuff together. So in the case of the remote monad, what we do is we send across packets that are Multiple commands, zero or more commands, terminated by a procedure. Except in the very end of a send command, anything left over is flushed. We can see this here. If you say something, we don't talk to the network. We just, talk, we just stick it in a data structure. We stick it into a state that we carry until we're sending a procedure, at which point we're sending a packet. And that packet consists of a list of commands and the procedure you want to call. And then right at the end, we do a flush of anything that's left over, if there is anything left over. You get the idea? All that's going on is you're choosing and saying, is there a systematic way I can bundle stuff together? Commands, don't send immediately because you will be doing them later anyway. Store them. And procedures, at that point, you flush all your commands and this, the procedure at the same time. And because of the monadic laws that we've already shown, already assumed, uh, you can rebundle in any direction, and uh, these properties hold. So, to see what happens here, if we try toast, exactly the same code, 
now with a strong uh, remote monad implementation, we can see that the first say, nothing gets sent. And then we have the temperature, at which point it goes, ah, I need to know the results of the temperature, and I want to say this, so I'll send them both at the same time. This assumes there's no way of pausing, so at the end you do have to do, and you see down here, you have to flush what's there at the end of, uh, of say, and this assumes there's no way of locally pausing when you're inside the remote monad, but you can't, because all you can evaluate in the remote monad is bind, return, fail, but we're working on that, uh, and all the primitives. So you can't do anything else. You can't locally pause. But you can only ask to remotely do things. To, so to summarize the remote monad, and then I'm going to look at some performance figures, uh, we have a weak remote monad that has a trivial binding stra a, a bundling strategy of just send everything one at a time. And we have a strong remote monad that bundles together as many commands as it can get, terminated by a procedure, unless it's the very end of the send command, in which case it sends all the commands that are left on the queue to be sent. There's also a multiplicative functor. And the multiplicative functors have a real nice property that you cannot take the result of one computation and then rely on it and then use its result for the next computation. You can bundle procedures together in a way that you can't in a monad. So in a monad, you can have a, a result which you use to, do the, to make a choice. You can't do that uh, with just the, the plug at the functor uh, primitives. So you can bundle. So there's another set of strategies, a weak and a strong, for the applicative functor as well. We've got this nice property. And in the paper, we go one step further. There's a way of uh, faking uh, such that a user-facing procedure is actually a command. And the great thing about commands is they can get bundled together. So it's a variant of using a deep embedding and, and monadic uh, reification. So quickly, the question is, how much does this cost? Uh, the uh, the answer is, well, of course, it completely depends. Programming graphics is something that's really quite nice because there's lots of commands. Draw, move, pixel goes here, and there's very few queries. So for command-centric examples, we tried it on four different, well, two different systems, two different browsers on uh, six benchmarks, uh, an asteroids uh, like example, uh, splatting circles to the screen, etc. And what you can see is it's all over the place, but roughly between 2 and 10. Chrome looks like it's not doing very well. Actually, it's doing the best because this is relative of these two things. Chrome does so well executing that uh, the relative performance of Haskell is less. But actually, its overall performance is, is more than adequate. And that's, so that's commands. What about procedures? Well, procedures aren't nearly as good, obviously. In a procedure, you have to go across and you have to get back. In the previous example, I always terminate with a procedure to keep it in sync. But in this case, you have inner loops that are doing horrible things. In this case, it's much, much more expensive. That's not a surprise. Well, what about two data URL? That's when you ask for a snapshot of your screen. So even in JavaScript, you're getting all the data back. So it turns out if your remote procedure is really expensive, it can dominate the cost of even the networking that goes on. So there are some basic performance numbers there. Uh, the, we have four projects that are using the remote monad right now. We have Blank Canvas, which is a graphics library we use for teaching. We have a remote JSON, a JSON RPC library that we're using. You can see the pattern here, the, the uh, natural transformation appearing at the end. We have a library that, uh, that uses the strong a remote monad to contact Arduinos. We have an older project with Sunroof that translates to JavaScript. And we have Lambda Bridge, which uh, sends packets across to access internal buses on hardware. All of these, we have a student attached to them. Uh, and uh, again, we're just using the same pattern, the same simple pattern to get things done. If you look in the literature, you can see there's many examples of this already, although I couldn't find a name for it. I contacted several of the authors of these packages and they couldn't either and they were quite excited that we've got now uh, something we can call what, what's going on. Uh, but you can see the uh, different examples there, database accesses, uh, Simon Marlowe and Facebook's uh, Haxel. Uh, uh, Accelerate is another unusual example. Where's the monad? Well, pretend it's identity monad. But what you're doing is you're taking an expression of uh, acting on arrays and sending it remote, then you want to do that remotely to get an answer back. 
So it's not an I.O. monad, it's an identity monad. So, so to conclude, the remote monad design pattern is when a remote monad is used to express a remote API and you've got a send function. The weak is trivial, the strong is a better bundling, the performance cost we found between uh, tw uh, 2 and 10 on our examples, and there are other bundling strategies you can do as well. One of the open questions is can you merge the best of applicative functors and monads in terms of bundling strategies? And that's something we're working on uh, right now. Okay, thank you. So this is a lot of fun. Uh, it may be just a little too close to lunch. I didn't quite understand your presentation of performance. The cost is two and 10 times what? So I was comparing, so I did rush through that slide. Uh, I was comparing a JavaScript implementation of a benchmark to splat asteroids on a screen and a Haskell implementation that used Haskell, the remote monad, and a library to connect the two. Okay. So. Yeah, so I was comparing, uh, uh, Ryan Newton says we seem fast and then we compare ourselves with others and we're not quite so fast. This was comparing ourselves with others. So. Uh, it's Pac-Man complete. That's the key word that I've been told to use. You can write Pac-Man in that library. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay. Thanks. Thanks.